Okay, thank you. And um, this is such a fantastic uh, meeting. I'm so excited to be uh, presenting here at home. And um, so I'm going to um, just start out by giving you an overview of the work that my lab does. We are a very diverse lab and we have two broad biological questions that we ask um, using a wide array of organisms. Um, one is um, the cellular and epigenetic uh, mechanisms that uh, create susceptibility to environmental toxicants. And you heard from Patrice yesterday talk about um, our work on arsenic. Um, in her flash talk, and then um, and the other part of the lab is really uh, deeply embedded in epigenetics and uh, thinking about how changes, broad scale changes to the epigenome, um, prime tissues during development, regeneration, and cancer. And we just started a new project on how aging affects the pattern of the epigenome, and it was really exciting to see um, Professor Partridge uh, last night, and it gave us a lot of great ideas. So. Um, the, um, the work that we're doing in zebrafish is really to understand the mechanisms of arsenic toxicity and um, how arsenic metabolism uh, contributes to the long term, the short and long term effects, um, as well as the novel functions of um, very well characterized factors that mediate both arsenic metabolism and the stress response. And I invite you to see Nuf and Patrice at their posters. They presented yesterday, but I think you can catch them today. Um, and then the other members of the lab who um, use uh, zebrafish, mice, and octopus to ask questions about how widespread epigenetic repatterning causes cancer, alters the progression of the cell cycle during development, primes the liver for regeneration, um, regulates transposons, and contributes to aging. And I encourage you to go to the posters of um, Bhavani, Filippo, Yusra, and uh, Charlene. So, um, our lab has been interested in regeneration for a long time, and um, I come from a vertebrate um, model organism background, and we know that um, on the tree of life, um, mammals are the worst of all in their ability to regenerate. Um, other vertebrates are highly regenerative, like axolotl and zebrafish, and invertebrates, uh, pretty much universally can regenerate their tissues. And one amazing example of this is um, the octopus arm. This um, octopus lose portions of their arm as a normal part of their, um, of their life cycle, and they grow back very quickly. This was rec um, recognized over 100 years ago, and this beautiful um, monograph um, written by Matilda Lang um, showed the stages of octopus arm regeneration. So we've known a lot about how um, the process of regeneration in um, octopus as well as other animals, but really how it's regulated still remains a mystery. Um, the one exception to this uh, non-regenerating uh, regenerative paradigm in mammals is the liver. The liver can regenerate after both injury and resection. Um, and so we thought there must be some sort of a code that allows the liver to regenerate um, which is not present in other organs. So we first started just by looking at the liver and trying to figure out what this code was. Um, and so I want to introduce you to um, the, the model of regeneration. So many of us, when we think about regeneration, we think about it in this complete reforming of structures like in the um, clipped zebrafish tail where the structures form from a blastema and completely regrow. And this is the same type of regeneration we see in octopus arms and in many other um, re limb regeneration. Um, paradigms. The liver is different. So the liver, um, when the most common model to study liver regeneration is a removal of part of the liver, it's a resection, clean resection of a few lobes, and then the remaining lobe compensates by re, uh, regrowing. Um, so no, none of the resected lobes themselves actually um, grow out. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is using this model of, um, of liver regeneration in mouse um, to uh, where we've uncovered an epigenetic code that regulates um, gene expression as well as transposon suppression in the liver. Um, and then we have this unanswered question, I think this is an unanswered question not just for our lab but for the field, uh, about if there's, what is this code that allows other tissues to be so highly regenerative in those organisms that can regenerate well. And I'll talk to you, um, I won't be able to answer this question today, but this is something we're clearly interested in. Um, and then um, 
we're also very interested in what is this epigenetic code that might prime um, highly regenerative organisms to, uh, to regenerate. So I don't need to introduce the um, epigenome in too much detail here, except to say that it's very complicated. And really, um, we have only been able to study the epigenome in its totality. Um, and we're really at the infancy of that studying because we have both the advent of genomics, so we can look at epigenetic marks across the genome, as well as machine learning that allows us to um, combine different epigenetic marks to create a code across the um, entire genome. So um, this has been used really beautifully. Um, it was uh, first uh, almost uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the principle is that if you have multiple epigenetic marks and you use machine learning to find um, which marks um, coexist very strongly and which ones are anti-correlated, you come up with these multiple epigenetic states um, or chromatin states. And um, you can see, for example, um, you know, if you have uh, high DNA accessibility, this is associated with um, uh, high and active genes, um, as opposed to um, very low expression. There's no chromatin accessibility. They're very highly methylated. Um, and really interestingly, you find lots of, when you do this kind of um, combinatorial uh, assessment, you find lots of things that are somewhat counterintuitive. So for example, um, strong transcription is also is associated with very high levels of DNA methylation across the gene body. Um, so um, we used a similar approach um, to uh, profile the mouse liver and to ask um, what is the code in the, um, in the mouse liver. And this is a project that was carried out primarily by um, Qi Zhang um, and uh, with help from Filippo Macchi. And it was um, based on uh, profiling that we did of multiple epigenetic marks as well as chromatin accessibility and a histone variant. And this gives us a very um, rich um, number of elements to the code to then look at combinatorially to see which areas of the genome these are concentrated in or excluded from. And so um, this process gives us um, six different chromatin states in um, the mouse liver. Um, there are three of the states are characteristic of open chromatin. Two of them are characteristic of closed chromatin, with each one really having a unique identity of which epigenetic marks um, are enriched in those states. But um, interestingly for us and good for all of those, all of those, um, all of you who are looking to build a career in. Uh, epigenomic um, studying or epigenomic um, studies. While we combined all these states and we covered only about 12% of the genome, meaning that about, you know, almost 90% of the genome has no known marks. And when we line this up with something like ENCODE, which has, you know, profiled many more marks, they don't get that number much better. So if you line up all the ENCODE data, we cover about 15% of the genome. So there's another you know, 80 to 90% of the genome that we don't really know what the epigenetic profile or pattern is on that, um, uh, on that broad um, swath of the genome. Um, I, the only thing that we do know is in this unmarked state, so that's state four right here, it's not enriched for any marks. The only thing that we find very highly enriched there is DNA methylation. So this um, state four represents, you know, 88% of the genome, and this is where a lot of the methylation is sitting. Um, what we also see, so we're, we're very interested in transposons and how the epigenome rec re regulates um, transposons and suppresses them. And what we found was that um, while most of the transposons are sitting in these closed chromatin states, we we're really interested that there was still a pretty healthy collection of transposons sitting in open chromatin states, especially these LTR transposons, which are young and dangerous. And we think that this is really interesting. We have a project on this, but I'm not going to talk about that today. But I'm very happy to talk to you about that afterwards. So um, when we look at the genes, we predicted that open chromatin would have all of the expressed genes, and that's, of course, what we found. So um, in the open um, states, we have most of the genes reside there and most of the expressed genes reside there. Um, you can see this um, raindrop plot shows you that all these genes that are enriched in the liver, you know, liver-specific genes are all in these open states and highly expressed. Um, but I was really interested in, in these genes. So what are these genes that are sitting in open chromatin states, but they're not expressed? And so um, uh, 
I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to summarize where we are. So we, um, we found that hepatic chromatin states, they define the um, gene expression pattern as well as the um, transposon profile in the liver. Um, we found that all genes in closed states are repressed. That makes sense. Um, most TEs are in closed, transposable elements are in closed states, but some of the most dangerous ones reside in open states. So it's really interesting to, um, for me, to me to try to figure out how those um, young and dangerous TEs are suppressed. And then, um, as I showed you, most expressed genes are in open states. So, okay, that makes sense. There's nothing really um, new here. Um, but what we were interested in is what are these genes that are not expressed but are sitting in open states? And so uh, what she did is he took um, all of the genes that are in um, the open states, so that would be the green and the yellow here, um, as well as the ones that are in the most repressed state, that would be the ones in blue, and he um, looked at the, um, the function of these genes, and these all function in, in pathways that we know are very important in the liver. Um, and um, then we looked at these genes that are silenced, and this is where we got a real surprise um, that was exciting. And so if you look at the green ones, for example, you see cell cycle, DNA re recombination, chromosome segregation, DNA replication. So all these genes that are involved in progression of the cell cycle, but this is a quiescent tissue. There's no cell division happening in the liver in quiescent states. So what this said to us is that these cell cycle genes are all sitting in the open states ready to go, but they're not expressed under quiescent, um, quiescent uh, conditions. So um, we looked a little bit more carefully at these to try to dissect out what are the uh, features that are repressing these genes. And when we um, looked at um, this, um, one of our favorite um, silencing marks, H3K27 trimethyl, we found that um, there are genes in um, state um, one and two, these open states that ha are enriched with um, H3K27. Of course, they're not as enriched as the silenced genes because those genes are silenced and repressed by this, but this was interesting to us. And we also found that these same genes that were, ex um, um, uh, we found that these genes that were silenced and, and marked by H3K27 um, were also enriched by an activating mark, H3K4 trimethyl. Um, so that was interesting, and what we found was that over regenerative time, the, um, the accumulation of um, H3K27 on these genes, so these are um, chips seek done um, following partial hepatectomy, the H3K27 is lost, but the H3K4 is maintained, and these genes are all turned on. Um, so this to us created a, sort of a, a explanation of how this epigenetic code was regulating these genes, keeping them off in the quiescent state, and then when the signal comes, H3K27 uh, is removed. Um, so we call this the ready, set, go model, and um, what we've shown, um, and I, I won't go into the data now um, because it's already been published, is that these are, these are indeed the genes that come up very quickly following regeneration, and they're all the genes that are involved in cell cycle control. So the model that we have is that um, on these cell cycle genes in the quiescent liver, both H3K27 and H3K4 are sitting there. These are um, what we call bivalent genes. And then when the signal to regenerate comes, H3K27 is removed by a process that we don't know, removing the repression and allowing the activation of these genes and entry into the cell cycle and regeneration. Um, so what I've told you now is that um, we have these, uh, these chromatin states that we've defined in the liver. Um, they both predict gene expression under um, homeostatic conditions as well as um, uh, predict the pattern of gene expression that occurs upon, stimuli, uh, upon stimulus to undergo regeneration. Um, and we believe that H3K27 trimethyl is one of the keys to regulating these um, pro-regenerative genes. And um, we have projects in the lab now to really dig into that more mechanistically. Um, and hopefully, you know, next time we see you, we'll be able to give you some updates on that. Um, so I'd like to, um, to switch gears now and um, talk about our work in um, other systems. And so since we've now, from the mouse liver, identified this epigenetic code that we believe primes the liver for regeneration, is it a same or similar code that might prime um, uh, highly regenerative animals for regeneration. Um, and we've done this work primarily in um, octopus. 
And we have many, many questions. So um, first of all, when, um, uh, when I started working on this, and I will say that this is um, all of the sample collection is done. We don't have octopuses here at NYU Abu Dhabi. All of the sample collection is done um, by me as well as by Filippo um, from my longstanding um, work every summer at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole in the US. Um, and so um, when we decided to go and start, I, you know, pursuing this question of is there an epigenetic code that allows octopus arms to be so highly regenerative, um, we then um, realized we had no idea what any epigenetic marks were in cephalopods at all. So that was step one. We had to figure out whether or not the epigenetic machinery was conserved and if those marks are there. Um, and then look at to see if these marks behave the same way in cephalopods that they do in um, vertebrates. Um, then we can start looking at regeneration and, um, and start profiling the marks that we think are important. So um, we have been doing this um, work primarily, as I said, on um, octopus bimaculoides, but because we have um, such incredible um, uh, animal husbandry there, there's a cephalopod um, uh, resource center there, we're able to also investigate um, the same questions in other uh, cephalopod species. So, we started really by looking at DNA methylation, and pretty much anybody who does comparative epigenomics, this is where we start. Um, profiling the DNA methylome doesn't require any species-specific reagents, so all you need really is a genome and some genomic DNA, and, um, and you're good to go. So when we talk about DNA methylation, we talk about methylation of cytosines in the CPG configuration. And what you see in vertebrates um, is that, you know, there's most of the DNA methylation studies are done in vertebrates, but the DNA methylation profile in vertebrates is pretty boring because it's static across tissues for the most part. There are millions of CPGs that are methylated, nearly all CPGs in um, vertebrate genomes are methylated. And if you compare, um, single cell um, whole genome bisulfite sequencing from hepatocytes or fibroblasts, if you look at these red and blue lines here, they pretty much line up identical. Um, identically, because the primary role for DNA methylation in vertebrates is to suppress transposons. So they, DNA methylation collects on transposons in every cell. There are, of course, some cell-specific differences, and because you're looking at millions and millions of CPGs, you can always find a difference. But Note that those differences are always found on the backdrop of about 99.9% .9 homogeneity across tissues in, ma in mammals, with exceptions of cancer and uh, development and gametes. Um, okay, and so once a methylation pattern is established, it's copied um, from one cell to the other by, um, some, uh, by a DNA methyltransferase and by one of the genes that my lab has been studying for a long time, which is the partner for DNA methyltransferase in maintenance methylation. So um, we've known um, for a while that DNA methylation is highly variable across um, the animal kingdom um, with humans, mice, um, zebrafish having very high levels of DNA methylation, and then animals like um, the honeybee or um, having very, very low to almost none. Um, octopus, this just came out uh, a few years ago, octopus having very low DNA methylation. So this is just the global DNA um, methylome levels. Um, and we know that if you look across um, um, all of eukaryotes, there are very different patterns of methylation. So not only is methylation present in some and absent in some, even if methylation is present, the pattern can be quite different. So for example, um, in animals, you have, um, like in honeybee, you have only methylation on gene bodies. If, um, very little methylation, um, as well as um, uh, in, in humans, for example, you have methylation on some gene bodies as well as transposons. So the not only the level, the pattern changes um, by species. And what is really interesting is that those species with low or no DNA methylation have comparatively low um, uh, transposon burden compared to those that have very high transposon burden. So this is still a correlation, but this makes sense that we know in vertebrates, DNA methylation suppresses transposons. But what's it doing in, um, in those low methylation um, uh, 
animals. So, um, and I do want to point out because I know there's a lot of um, uh, Drosophila and C. elegans aficionados in the um, in the room. Um, there is no DNA methylation in these um, organisms. So, the study of DNA methylation has largely been, con been confined to vertebrate. Um, model organisms like human, mouse, and zebrafish. Although with the explosion of genomes, uh, um, we um, across many, many invertebrates, there is now a wealth of data on the methylation patterns in uh, non-model organisms. Um, so we asked, what's the pattern in cephalopods? And so what, um, what we did is we collected um, samples from octopus and um, uh, two other species of cephalopods. We looked at total DNA methylation as well as profiled it um, from one hatchling and compared it with publicly available data. Um, and so what I um, uh, would like you to focus on here is when we look at the level of methylated um, CPGs, so those CPGs that are highly methylated across tissues, those are really concentrated in introns um, as well as in exons, whereas the, um, the low methylated uh, CPGs are all in the intergenic space. So this is completely different from what we see in uh, vertebrates where most of those CPGs are all sitting in the intergenic space. Um, and so then what Filippo did was he um, took a look because of course we wanted to look at the transposons and um, no surprise here, if we look at these CPG dense transposable elements, they have very, very low to no DNA methylation in octopus samples, whereas transcripts have relatively high levels of uh, DNA methylation. And so this um, was uh, followed a paradigm that we know from other invertebrates where you have um, uh, some DNA methylation on some genes, but no DNA methylation on transposons. So everything made sense. Um, and I'm showing you the transposon data here. So um, very different from what we see in mice with all types of transposons, all families of transposons, very high levels of CPG methylation. It's really non-existent in uh, octopus. Um, so next we asked, well, are all genes uh, highly methylated in octopus, or is it a subset? And it is a subset of genes. So um, what Filippo did is he clustered all of the genes based on their uh, methylation levels, um, and then uh, looked across uh, three different tissues and found that those patterns were maintained regardless of the tissue. So genes that have high level of methylation in a whole hatchling have high level of methylation in the brain. Genes with low level or no methylation in hatchling have no methylation in the brain, and those intermediate Pat patterns are also maintained. And then he um, asked what was the comparison with expression, and we found that these genes in the um, highly methylated genes have high expression, and they tend to be highly expressed across tissues, um, whereas the genes with, um, uh, with, um, uh, that have low or silent expression are um, down here. Um, so Next thing that Filippo did was he went on to ask, well, are there other elements of the epigenetic code that are conserved in cephalopods? And um, using Western blot, he showed that the answer is yes. And very excitingly, we have different levels of histone modifications in different tissues of cephalopods um, across cephalopod species. So this is really um, exciting because this suggests that there is a dynamic way that uh, genes are regulated in uh, cephalopods using these same histone marks that we know very well from other species. So um, then finally, in our work on DNA methylation, so we've done lots of work to profile it and look how it changes or not across tissues and species, but is it important? We st the level of DNA methylation is very low in, in cephalopods, and um, so maybe it's, um, it doesn't have an important function, or um, we really didn't know the answer to that. So um, last summer, we were um, able to get these really adorable um, octopus uh, embryos, and expose them to uh, a DNA demethylating agent. We also have these, um, um, these unbelievably cute but very hard to um, work with um, Euprimnoberii embryos, and we expose them to a de DNA demethylating agent for about a week, and we found that this severely disrupts their um, development. You can see this is the control. This, these have these arms are gray and short. The same with this. this the arms don't grow out. The head hasn't grown um, as expected. And 
Um, so we take this, this very preliminary data, but we take this to suggest that DNA methylation is important, blocking it really disrupts development, and our next work is to try to figure out what it's doing. So um, the take home messages from this are that um, there, are, there is DNA methylation in cephalopods and other mollusk genomes. It's lo very low compared to vertebrates. It's concentrated on a subset of gene bodies and these gene bodies that are um, methylated are highly expressed across tissues. And we also have um, discovered that many of the um, epigenetic marks that we're interested in that regulate gene expression are present at dynamic levels across cephalopod tissues. So now we're really primed to look at the pattern of DNA methylation as well as histone modification during regeneration as well as during development. Um, we're in a good position to be able to profile these marks to really look at how they correlate and regulate gene expression and transposon suppression. And um, we're also very interested in how these different patterns, high methylation in vertebrates, low methylation in octopus, are established. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the people that did the work. Um, Filippo is really leading on the cephalopod project, and he has um, a poster. Um, um, and he also uh, help, helped out with the um, liver regeneration study. Um, Yusra is also working on liver regeneration in the context of aging. Um, and Bhavani and uh, Bhavani, Elena, Patrice, um, and Noof are um, all working on um, uh, zebrafish projects. And they, um, many of them have posters. So please go to see those. I want to just give a shout out to the genomics core and the bioinformatics team. We would not be able to do this work without them. They are really, really incredible, and we're so lucky to be here. And then I'd like to end with a pitch. We are hiring anybody interested in a postdoc um, or knows somebody interested in a postdoc position. Please come see us. Thank you. Thank you.